Good morning, Maddie and you and Hope. Can you hear me? Yeah. Cool. Uh, Maddie, could you turn your camera on for when you present? Nice kitchen. All right. We're going to get underway in a second here, so I'll let you know when you can go, okay? All right, Maddie, whenever you're ready. Okay. Do you Hold want on. me to do my laptop? Hold on one moment. You need to try to figure out how to get your microphone on my computer. Okay, go ahead and talk if you could so we can test this. Okay, can you hear me? Yeah, perfect. Okay, hang on. I just got to get it up. No problem. Okay. And the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but kind to everyone, able to teach, patiently enduring evil, correcting his opponents with gentleness. May, God may perhaps grant them repentance, leading to a knowledge of the truth, and they may come to their senses and escape from the snare of the devil, after being captured by him to do his will. 2 Timothy 2, 24-26. As we have learned in previous classes, Paul was commissioned by Christ to go to the Jews and Gentiles to preach the good news of the gospel. Early in the passage, Paul preaches to the Jews and Gentiles about treating all people with kindness and the love of the truth. Upon hearing the love of the truth, they rejected it and went on willingly believing the lies of Satan. The Jews and the Gentiles were taken captive by the wickedness and evil doings of sin, death, and the devil. Just like the Jews and the Gentiles, we too are taken captive by the deceitfulness of Satan and the sinful nature of the world. This week, as we are learning about philosophies and ethics, we also learn more about the captivity of all people, whether they are believers or not. Christians can easily be taken captive can easily be taken captive by veering off of the path God has set us set out to go. Dal Taggett says that as believer, believers, we end up buying the lie, causing us to become the captive. Although being taken captive is easily done, the Lord is able to free us from our bondage. Because he sent his only son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross, we are set free from captivity and are given the precious gift of eternal life. We can thank God for this wonderful gift every day and night. We pray. Dear Lord, thank you for sending your only son to die on the cross for us to free us of our bondage to sin, death, and the devil. We ask that you continue to be with all of those who are sick. Please allow them to be brought back to health quickly. Thank you for your continuous blessings. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thanks a lot, Maddie. Okay, you guys, please take out your chapter two, lesson two uh, worksheet. There's a free one key on there. And, um, we finished off with the quotes. Number five, we finished, and we are heading towards number six coming up very shortly.
knowledge comes from there. No, knowledge comes from over there. Well, okay. All right, so these are, just to review, these are some examples of that hollow and deceptive worldly philosophy uh, that we have kind of descended to after turning our backs on uh, what we ought to do, right? And what we ought to do is follow God's word. Um, but we, we turn our backs, and this is where we end up. James, do you mind putting the lights on here? You can close the door, too. Make sure we sanitize the, uh, the handle and the lights. All right, here we go. There is no knowledge. All of them hollow and deceptive because they shut themselves off from the very source of the universal truth which they seek. When I uh, attended Kansas State University, I attended a philosophy class, my first philosophy. And I will never forget, I was sitting in the front row on the end in my chair, and the philosopher professor in his lecture began to explain to us a philosophy that begins without thought. And he looked at me and he said, Sir, you do not even know whether or not the chair that you're sitting on is really real. Well, I immediately felt my chair. And he says, oh, but you didn't even know that the fingers on your hand are real. And I remember looking at my fingers. I was just a farm boy from Idaho. And then I looked around the room and I said, I'm paying for this? <laughs> hollow and deceptive philosophy. Where does it lead us? Where does it take us? Well, it does not take us to the universal answers. It takes us to depression and despondency and despair and loneliness. You don't know, nor you can be sure that the seat you're sitting on is really real. How foolish, how silly. That then leads us to a philosophy which has captured our culture and continues to capture our culture called postmodernism. Postmodernism in the end is just saying that there is no truth. But you know what? You can't live in a world like that. You can't live in a world that says there is no truth, that there is no absolute truth, that your truth and my truth may be totally opposite, and they're both true. Ravi has a, has a great story talking about this issue of what happens when you try to live, when you try to match your philosophy with reality. Some years ago, I was speaking at Ohio State University, and I was taken to see the Wexner Center of the Arts. And uh, they wanted me to see it, and I wondered why. And when I walked into that building, I said, what is the building all about? So there are staircases that go nowhere. There are pillars that serve no purposes. And the man driving me said, this is America's first postmodern building. And the architect said, if life itself has no purpose, why should our buildings have any design or any purpose? So he built it at random without any purpose, as it were. I said, I have one question for you. He said, what's that? I said, did you do that with the foundation as well? What do you suppose the answer was? <laughs> no, you can't do that with the foundation. In other words, you're just playing a game here. Stairways that go to nowhere, pillars that have no purpose. You're just playing a game because you cannot live in a non-reality insane world. But that is where philosophy has taken us. When you shut yourself off from God, that's what you're left with. The fool says in his heart, there is no God. Well, there are some great ethical implications that come as a result of this. How do you answer the question, what is right and what is wrong? It 
if you begin with this kind of a philosophy, if you begin with nothing but the cosmic cube, and if you and I are just natural cosmic accidents in the box, then how do you answer the question, what is right and what is wrong? Is there anything that you can do that is not natural if you're a product of the stuff in the box? No. Because if you do something that is unnatural, where did that come from? It can't come from outside the box. There's nothing outside the box. Answering the question what is right and what is wrong now becomes one of the fundamental problems associated with the culture that has turned its back upon God. This brings us to the second pillar of ethics. What is right? What is wrong? Who makes the rules? In fact, if this is your philosophy, I'll tell you what makes the rules. Might makes wrong. Whether or not that might is bound up in the strength of an individual or the power of his weapons or whether or not that might turns out to be simply 51% of the vote. That's what you're left with. How does the world answer that question? How can they answer that question? Light is right and light is wrong. Okay, how do I determine right from wrong? Well, as I look at it, how can we explain it? By the pros and the cons, I suppose. How do I do it? I just, you know it. Some people. What's right to them is in right to other people. I uh, purely believe that it's the way they're brought up. I think partly it's what my parents told me were right and wrong. I determine right from wrong. Well, based on if I would do it with my mom and with me. <laughs> a very big part of it. If my mom was in the room, I, I would not do the wrong things or I would do them very quickly. I think we have an internal clock that tells us right from wrong. Man will either be governed by force or by the will of his own heart. Cheating on your wife with adultery, yeah. not a good idea. If you do bad things, you smack your eye in your life. I always judge by my religion first and then I see if it's right or wrong. As a Unitarian Universalist, since we're a non-credal religious tradition, we don't have a set doctrine to which to turn to look for a specific answer. Murdering people in cold blood is not a good idea for a civil society. Not stealing is a good idea. Coveting or envy, it's good mental health. And certainly there are, there are valuable things to be derived from the Ten Commandments. We might turn to some scripture from the Hebrew Bible or from the New Testament, through the sutras. We might turn to the Quran. We might turn to Tao Te Ching from Taoism. Um, all of these things might be sources of authority. I don't think that you can say that something is definitely right or definitely wrong. There can't be two contradicting laws of the universe if you do something you feel guilty about it, I suppose. That means that for you, it was something wrong. Not everybody has the same set of rules they play by. The way I live, I don't care. Other people don't agree with me. That's my opinion, and, and that's the way I live, and I ain't hurt you. That's the way I'm gonna be. There has to be some law, otherwise, there's anarchy. We don't know how to answer this question without thought. Do we fall back on simply some utilitarian position, some pragmatic decision, something that just simply says, well, um, if it's the uh, best for this society, then that's what's right. What about the minority? When might begins to make right, you will find a lot of people oppressed and crushed without God. So where do we turn to? What do we look to? You ought to know the answer. Wow. Well, that's what the world does. The world wants to find it within the box. Where do we go? To God. Remember, fundamentally, he is the ultimate source of truth. Now, let's go back to Plato for a second. Plato had an interesting question. 
And his question was this. Is an act right because God wills it? In other words, is, is an act right simply because God said it? Or did God know it was right and he told us about it? What's the answer to Plato's question? A or B? Both A. Both A and a great political response. <laughs> if we say it is right because God knew about it, that it implies that he knew about something external to himself. If we say that it's right simply because he said it, then we might follow William of Ockham. I'm sure you're familiar with William of Ockham, are you not? The 300s, William of Ockham said, well, hey, whatever God wills must be done simply because he says so. If God had wanted, he could have ordered men to obey the opposite of the Ten Commandments. Even now, he can rescind those laws and will their opposite. Do you believe that to be true? Why not? It means God could change. It means that God could change, and we know that God is unchanging. Do you suppose God was in heaven, and he took out a quarter? Does anyone have a quarter? No one has any money. Oh, William has a quarter. May I borrow it? Thank you very much. Do you suppose that God was in heaven? And he said, you know what? These people need some rules here. Let's make ten of them. And he had some coins. And this coin, he had written on one side, lying is wrong. On the other side, it said, lying is virtuous. And he flipped the coin, and it landed up, lying is wrong. <laughs> Write it, Moses. <laughs> Why is lying wrong? These things don't work. Love. They don't work? That's a practical reason. What's that? Uh -huh. Because God can't lie. This is not a practical issue. Lying is wrong because it is counter to the very nature of God. He didn't write a bunch of rules for us, some capricious list for us to follow. He is expressing his very nature. Lying is wrong because it gets counter to his very nature and his character. That's why it's wrong. So we would say that William of Ockham was wrong. God could not have rescinded them and willed the opposite because they are expression of his nature. Now I want to show you a brief clip. We talk about the implication of what happens when you shut yourself off from God. This is a debate between Dr. William Provine and Dr. Philip Johnson. It took place at Stanford University. It was fundamentally talking about the implications of, of natural uh, evolution. Let's look at it and listen to Dr. Provine. And when you die, you're not going to be surprised because you're going to be completely dead. Now me, now me, if I, if I live after I'm dead, I'm going to be really, really surprised. But at least, at least, I'm going to go to hell, where I won't have all those grinning creatures from Sunday morning with me. Let me summarize my views on what modern evolutionary biology tells us, loud and clear, and I must say that these are basically Darwin's views. There are no gods, no perfect forces of any kind, no life after death. When I die, I am absolutely certain that I'm going to be completely dead. That's just all that's going to be the end of me. There's no ultimate foundation for ethics, no ultimate meaning in life, and no free will for human beings. What an unintelligible idea. Christian humanism has a great deal going for it. It's warm, it's kindly in many ways. Not maybe not the people who are a little different, but that's all right. If you're gay, if you're gay it's not so hot for many Christians. But anyway, let's leave that aside and look at the good parts of Christian humanism. The bad part is that you have to suspend your rational mind. And that part is really nasty. Now, atheistic humanism has the advantage of cutting rational minds 
trying to understand the world, but I have the disadvantage of very little cultural heritage. And that's a real problem. So the question is, can atheistic humanism offer us very much? Well, sure, it can give you intellectual satisfaction. And I'm a heck of a lot more intellectually satisfied now that I don't have to cling to the fairy tales that I believed when I was a kid. So life may have no ultimate meaning, but I sure think it can have lots of proximate meaning. Free will is not hard to give up because it's a horribly destructive idea to our society. And since we know that we're not going to live after we die, there's no reward for suffering in this world. I mean, you live and then you die. And finally, there's no reason whatsoever that ethics can't be robust with no ultimate foundation for ethics. Okay, there's no ultimate foundation for ethics. Now, Dr. Probein is speaking in a non assumptive way. He's telling us straight, these are the implications of what happens when you begin with a cube with no God. There is no ultimate foundation for ethics. There is no ultimate meaning in life. But he can't live that way. So what does he say about ethics? Even though there's no ultimate foundation? They can be robust. It can be robust. And even though there's no meaning in life, no ultimate meaning in life, what does he hang to? Proximate. Proximate meaning. He has to. You can't live in that kind of a world. No gods, no purposing forces, no ultimate foundation for ethics, no free will, no life after death, no ultimate meaning in life. A pretty sterile box. Pretty sad answers to the ultimate questions. Dr. Sproul gives us the indication of what happens when you live in that kind of a philosophical world. With my students in the, in the seminary, I often talk to them about the crisis of of ethics in our day because of a little linguistic shift that may seem insignificant, but it's profound. Historically, there was a distinction between morality and ethics. Morality was a study of the mores of people, how in fact people behave in a given society or a given culture, where ethics sought the ethos, the transcendent uh, standard or norm for human behavior. In simple terms, it's this, morality is looks at the verb is this is what is ethics looks at the word ought okay but that distinction has been obscured in our day and people use the term morality and ethics uh, as synonyms and that leads to what i call statistical morality where we go around and we see what the morals of a nation are what people are doing how many people you know, cheat on their wives, how many people get uh, divorced and all that. We add up the statistics and we say, well, if 51% of the people do this, it's normal. And if it's normal, it's good. <laughs> because the good is determined by what is rather than by what ought to be. And in that sense, we have a crisis of the loss of the whole concept of ethics. Do you understand why we are so obsessed with statistics and survey today? is the only way we can try to understand what is right and wrong. And so we survey all kinds of things to find out what people are doing so we can figure out what is right and wrong. Is that the way we determine right and wrong? I'll tell you that leads to some horrible, ugly results. Have we been taken captive? The battle is real. See to it that no one takes you captive. In Barna's recent study, when he was trying to determine what percentage of the American population had a biblical worldview? The result of that study was pretty dismal. Only 4% of the general American population had a biblical worldview. And when it was sorted based upon the born again believers in America, it rose to an anemic 9%. Only 9% of born again believers in America have a biblical worldview. And that's only based on 10 fundamental questions. And then the rest of the survey determined that if you didn't have a biblical worldview, guess what? You pretty much live just like that. Chuck Colson made a, a stark statement. He said, the church's singular failure in recent decades has been the failure to see Christianity as a life system or worldview that governs every area of existence. And I agree with that. I think that is the big issue that we face. And the question now before us is, what is your worldview? What is your worldview? One of the problems we have 
in discussing this issue is the problem associated with trying to merge both a formal worldview and a personal worldview. Let me give you an idea of what we're talking about. A formal worldview, if you can picture a number of bookshelves up on the, on the case, and every one of those books are written on the spine has a formal worldview attached to it. Marxism, postmodernism, Islam, naturalism, secular humanism, Christianity. It is a comprehensive set of truth claims that purports to paint a picture of reality. And they are everywhere. And that is exactly what faces us today. But it's not just the formal worldviews that have their truth claims. But it is all those lies that bombard us from everywhere. It's the lie that leads to bulimia. It's the lie that leads to drug use. It's the lie that leads to infidelity. And they bombard us. I am not interested in whether or not you can answer the questions of what a formal worldview looks like. What I'm interested in is your personal worldview. And a personal worldview is a worldview that is composed of those individual truth claims that you have embraced so deeply that you believe they reflect what is really real. And therefore, they drive what you think, how you act, and what you feel. And that is what Jesus is getting at when he's talking about worry. He's talking about fear. What is it that you really believe? What is it that you believe is really real? Very seldom do we have a worldview that matches a formal worldview. Our worldview consists of all of these things that we have somehow bought, consciously or unconsciously, and it drives how we act, what we feel, and what we think. What are the consequences? When you buy the lies, you end up conforming to the world. The only solution I know of is, is found in Romans 12 too. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. We're probably living in the most anti-intellectual period in the history of the church. Not anti-scientific, not anti-academic, but anti-intellect, anti-mind. The Bible tells us that we are called as Christian people not to be conformed to this world, but to be transformed. And the way of that transformation is through the renewing of the mind. We have been made by our Creator to have a direct line from the brain or from the mind to the heart. And so for the scripture, the new mind brings with it always a new heart. But you can't bypass the mind in an attempt to have a renewed heart. And that's what people are trying to do today. I don't want to learn. I don't want to study the word of God. I want to have a feeling. I want to have a, uh, some kind of mystical experience. And let that supplant or replace the hard study of the content of the word of God. But the scripture says the way life changes is when the mind changes. You're beginning to get the connection that we have here. Jesus saying, for this reason I was born, and for this I came into the world to testify to the truth. And Romans 12, 2 is talking about not to be conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. We're pointed back again to this whole issue of truth. And do you understand the truth claims of God? And do you believe them? Do you trust them? Do you live as if they are really real? Romans 12, 2 uses an interesting word. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed. Unfortunately, that word is overused today in our culture. What is the Greek word for transform? Metamorpho. What do you think of when I say metamorpho? Metamorphosis. Metamorphosis, butterflies. That's right, butterflies. Butterflies are the pretty part of metamorphosis. What is the difficult part? The, the struggle in the cocoon. There are only three events that this word is used in the scripture. Here, the next one is in the transfiguration of Christ. Remember when Jesus was transfigured before the disciples? We translate it transfigured, but it is really the word metamorpho. We're not talking about a new pair of shoes here. We're not talking about a new dude. We're talking about something that is fundamentally transformation, metamorphosis. The only other place it's used is in 2 Corinthians. And we who with unveiled faces all reflect the Lord's glory are being metamorphed into his likeness with ever-increasing glory. Metamorpho. 
That is what we seek. If you're here to simply notch your cognitive bell, if you're here just to get a lot of uh, questions to be able to be answered in front of people, you're here for the wrong reason. We're seeking to be metamorphed. If we are not, we will find ourselves conforming to the world. Why do we do this? Why are we involved in this study? Several years ago, someone sent me this picture. And I looked at it with disgust, and I, and I threw it into the trash. And then it gnawed at me, and I went back and I pulled it out and looked at it. And yes, I was disgusted again. And then I set it aside. And then I kept thinking about it. I brought it back, and it was sitting on my desk for months. And I began to look at this picture and ask myself the question, what has this young man believed? What lies have driven him to think that he must pierce every part of his body? What is behind that? That is why we are seeking to be exposed by God, to be transformed by him, to see the culture around us and the state that it really is, and to be able to say, here am I, send me. Why do we do this? Well, there may be one other reason. Oh, I wonder how that picture got in there. Those are my grandsons, Judith and Micaiah. And that is why. That is why we must begin as the body of Christ to become conformed again, transformed into his image. If we do not believe the true claims of God and act in accordance with them, where will the light be? It will not be. And the cries, and the weeping, and the wailing will continue both within the body and without. That is what we're attempting to do. Father, may we not turn away from the struggle in the cocoon. It is not easy. It is difficult. It goes against our brain to want to go into a cocoon. Well, Father, I pray that every one of these people here will recognize and understand what it is that you are calling us to. A real metamorphosis. Maybe one right after the other. Father, may we not turn away from you. May we enter into the cocoon. Maybe with fear and fear but with willingness that says, here am I, take me. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay. Let's go through the remaining fill in the blanks, and then I'm going to give you the last 10 or so minutes of class to get your three one cues done and uh, post it to the classroom page. That way you don't have to worry about it over the weekend. Um, and tomorrow's pastor's Friday, just as a reminder. So let's go into it. We, uh, we left off last time with five, so let's go to six. Dr. William Provine, he was that, that older gentleman, uh, you know, giving a lecture, dark background. He said, when I die, I'm absolutely certain that I'm going to be completely dead. Well, is he? No. He's got a surprise waiting for him. He's going to be alive, and he's going to be feeling the heat. But he asked for it. Seven, morality looks at the verb is ethics looks at the word ought. ought. How do you spell ought? Good. O U G H T. This is an important one for you guys to know. So I would either highlight it, circle it, underline it. Um, know it. Please know it. So how do we know what we ought to do? Okay, God tells us. We look to God and his nature, right? Um, this is goes back to um, how Del Paco was saying did God you know, when Moses was on top of Mount Sinai, flip a coin and say, is, is lying bad? Well, let's see. 
okay, yes, it is bad, write it down. Of course not, right? God can't change a rule to be good that he has said is bad because God is unchanging, right? And morality reflects his nature. So it's always going to be bad. It's always going to be the same. Uh, no matter what country you live in, no matter what kind of government you have. And is that what we see playing out in you know countries today? What are some different ways that uh, that that people or countries determine what's right, what's wrong? I'll tell you right now, they don't look to God. So what do they do? They look to their leaders and try to listen to them on what's right and wrong. Sure, yeah. So sometimes you have dictatorships, right? Uh, one guy or girl who says, this is the way it's going to be, and you don't really have a say in it, right? Um, how did we get to the place where abortion is legal in this country? Hopefully we would all agree that it's wrong, it's murder. So why is it considered good or okay, acceptable? How did that happen? Who's our moral authority here? Are you able to take the first answer or the second one? It's kind of all the same. But go ahead, give me what you have. Well, well, the abortion is legal because it's the person's choice to have them. Okay, but why is it legal? We're looking at uh, the more broad question of why is abortion legal in the United States, even though, again, I hope we would all agree that it, it shouldn't be because it's it's sinful, it's it's terrible, it kills life. So, Abby. <laughs> yeah, basically, right? You look to the Supreme Court and uh, a few people who were elected to, or appointed to those offices, they made the decision. Um, at the end of the day, their decision is kind of a reflection on what people in the country believed at that time to be the right of the woman. So, again, we are turning our back on what God tells us should be the truth, what, how it ought to be. There's that word, ethics, ought. And instead, we're looking at, well, what's most convenient for us? And that's what it's going to be, what it is, morality, okay? Morality changes because people change, um, governments change. Uh, it's, it's ever shifting. But with God, there's only one truth. There's only one, uh, one list, right? He tells us what is right, what is wrong, and we ought to follow that for our own good and our own benefit. Number eight, only what percent of born-again believers in America have a biblical worldview? Nine. Only nine. And that number is only 4% for just general Americans when that poll was done. Number nine, the church's singular failure in recent decades has been a failure to see Christianity as a, a life system that governs every area of existence. Okay, so instead of just going to church on Sunday and then leaving it, leaving it be, not really thinking about it or uh, allowing it to influence your words or your actions throughout the course of your week, um, a lot of times, you know, you have your priester type Christians who go to church when it's uh, the holidays and they feel like a nostalgia for it. Um, you see other people who have uh, very different uh, uh, moral standards or um, you know, even political views that completely contradict what the Christian faith stands for. Uh, that would be another way where we kind of abandon it in certain areas of our life. And instead of having a, a Christian life, we have our life and then we have just a segment, which is our Christianity. Uh, and that's not how we're meant to be. Right? We're, we are called to be a Christian in every aspect, every vocation. Number 10, we are all called as Christian people not to be conformed to this world, but to be transformed. transformed. And that word metamorphosis or metamorpho uh, is what we're looking for here. And it goes back to more than a carpenter as well, right? This is not just a idle intellectual exercise deciding who Jesus is or, or why Christianity is right. Uh, we're talking about eternity here. You know, we're talking about our eternal uh, destination. And it matters, and truth matters. 
and hopefully uh, that point is being driven home so far this semester. Okay, take out your computers. You may already have your 312 written out on your sheet. If so, just transcribe it onto Google Doc and submit that assignment to the uh, Google Classroom assignment and you'll be all set to go for Monday. We'll use those 312s to review just a little bit and then take the quiz then as well. Quick reminder, tomorrow Pastor Barkley is coming to town for Pastor's Friday. Uh, sent him the list of the questions from last week. Nobody added anything new. That's okay. Uh, there should be plenty of uh, material. Uh, so I just ask that you bring your Bible and your journal. That should be all you need for tomorrow. All right? Yeah. Is it going to be recorded and posted? Um, yeah, sure. Because you're gone, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I will do that. Okay. Yeah. Um, speaking of which, I believe the Zoom recordings will be posted to like my YouTube channel. So I'll I'll get you guys those details uh, once that's all sorted out. But that's where uh, that's where all the recordings are probably going to be compiled. Just so you're aware. All right.